Welcome back. Hi, Christian. Hello. Our final talk for today, not the last, but the final, is uh, Christian Schlemper, who's a spokesman for Public Transport Authority of uh, Upper Elbe, and uh, he's going to, to, to talk to us about how integrated uh, public transport can better serve uh, citizens' need of, uh, of mobility. If it's okay with you, Christ uh, Christian, we just keep the same uh, format as before, so we keep uh, the presentation and reserve about five minutes towards the end for general discussion and questions. Yeah, I'll, I'll do my very best. I'll talk just fast and then it's all it's, good. <laughs> sounds good. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, dum, 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 dum. Okay, so uh, as already said, I'm the spokesman for the Public Transport Authority here in Dresden and the surrounding area. First of all, thank you very much that I'm invited, that I can join this very interesting project and that I can talk a little bit about our everyday work. Um, so we heard a lot about visions, how sometimes also public transport, or in many cases, public transport was mentioned at several times, um, how public transport can improve um, the life in the cities. And we are kind of working on this project as kind of our everyday business to better integrate public transport. How can we find new mobility chains um, to make uh, life uh, in the city and in the surrounding area better. And this is what I'm going to talk about uh, in the next um, 30 something minutes. So we're going to start with our model, with our structure and finance. And of course, that's very typical and specific for Germany and in many cases, typically German complicated, but I'll try uh, to bring, to, to shed some light on it. The overall idea is of course to have one schedule, one ticket, one price for all the transport companies who work in this area for all means of transportation. So from trains over suburban trains to trams, to buses and to ferries and all that also for tariff zones, but I will come back to that specific issue later on. Um, first of all, some some little bits of geography. Um, we are in, in German, we are called the Verkehrsverbund Oberelbe, which is the VVO, uh, the, the blue, the, the darker blue spot right in the middle. And you can see the federal state of Saxony, and it's divided into five public transport authorities. Um, that's kind of a long history of regional transport, suburban transport was always defined as being roughly 50 kilometers long. So a journey should never be longer than that. And this is where this division comes from. And we are currently in talks about integrating a bit more um, so that it makes uh, journeys easier uh, for the passengers. Um, <clears throat> this is our structure. And we are kind of a political body. And in Saxony, it was determined that the cities and the districts around the large cities should integrate their public transport and create a better integrated system for the passengers. And um, this is what's happened in the past. So there is this political body, which is called ZVOE. Um, and this political body then decided to establish a company, which is the VVO, who runs the everyday business. Um, and we work together with various transport companies, railway companies, to, to integrate the service. And I'm going to show you how we are doing this and what's our duty. So um, there is this overall political aim that we should increase the modal split in favor of public transport. So getting rid of cars, having more people using public transport by a better offering, by cooperating with transport companies to create an attractive, modern and reliable public transport. So that sounds very political. Everybody wants that. You can agree on that. Um, and how is that done? Um, in detail. First of all, uh, we established a single fare system with unified conditions of carriage, which means it is absolutely important um, that the passenger just buys one ticket and then he can change easily 
uh, using perhaps first a train, then a tram, then a bus to reach his destination so that he does not have to pay um, over and over again. And unified conditions of carriage sounds abstract, but before we were established, each of our companies had, for example, different minimum ages when it came to children. When, 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 would, when do they have to pay? The one company started at six, another company said at seven. Um, so this had to be integrated and unified. And we are responsible for our local public transport plan, um, which kind of sets the overall framework and for public transport. So we define in which corridors we want trains, where do we want trams, where do we want buses. And we work very closely together with the local authorities, but also with um, citizens groups or interest groups who, um, for example, represent people with disabilities and so on and so forth. So to kind of um, get all the various interests um, together and um, create so one proper integrated plan. As I already said, it's the framework. It always lasts for five up to two, up to 10 years. Um, and then it's constantly worked on modified and that uh, sets the, the framework. We coordinate timetables um, and that sounds very easy, but can be difficult um, because each company of course has its own interests um, how they want to structure their timetables. And then we come along and say, no, we want better connections between trains and buses, for example. So we always have to find compromises, uh, but we are constantly working on that. Um, we established one single timetable in the past that was one huge book, roughly 2000 pages. Um, today it's of course all digital. We try to unify marketing and distribution, which is, of course, also interesting because we have to compromise between our marketing approach, uh, which basically focuses on the aspect that you can change easily between the various companies. And then each company, of course, wants to have their own marketing because they don't uh, want to lose their brand image. Our most difficult task is the fair division of earnings among the companies which means um, you buy one ticket and you can ride with this ticket on various services. And in the end, each of the companies earns or gets a well, perfect share and uh, of the money you paid, but you only paid the fare at one company. So we are the one who tells the various companies how they have to divide the earnings uh, they made, um, which uh, of course is always a difficult task as you can imagine. We franchise railway services, so we get public money. I will come back to that in a minute um, in order to then hand out franchises for railway services for longer periods of time. And we have proper competition between various companies. And then there is something very exotic we have to do. We have to preserve historic narrow gauge railways. Um, as already said, financing public transport in Germany is difficult. Um, you see this myriad of various sources where money comes from the federal government in Germany. Uh, and this is the overview from 2020. We are currently up to 10 billion euros. Um, the federal government spends a lot of money on public transport, hands it down to the federal states. So we, we here in Saxony get roughly 600 and a bit million euros per year. And we use this money among all the various transport authorities, then to finance um, the railway franchises, but we also invest a lot of money. We finance partly trams and bus companies and help to invest um, in modern infrastructure um, at local authorities and the cities. So here you see just once again, the various responsibilities. The federal government in Germany is responsible for the railways um, and the cities and districts are responsible for trams and buses um, and we try to get all this together in order to, to integrate it so that we don't have any competition between the various modes of public transport because that just does not make sense so so much 
to public transport in general and now have a closer look at the idea of structures of cities and villages and the effects on public transport. So this is a very interesting overview, sadly only in German, but also interesting, the smaller the village, the more cars exist per household. So if you live in a village which, which has under 5,000 inhabitants, 56% um, of all households have two or even more cars, uh, which is colored in red, uh, and um, only 3% have no cars at all. And you see uh, the larger the city, um, the fewer cars exist in the households, which was also already mentioned in the presentations before. Yeah? You have this advantage in large metropolitan areas, you just don't need that many cars. Um, but here you see why it's, Tobias already had something similar, but he had a photo, I just have a map. Um, the idea of you have a lovely village uh, with all the various houses, here you see the red spots, and um, but you only have basically two bus stops and so you always have to walk just a long way and here we are at the issue of comfort zones that were already mentioned and so it's of course way more comfortable to use your car than walk a mile or so to reach the bus stop to use public transport in cities all that looks of course very different when you have many more people living closer together you have a better transport system, you have shorter ways to reach uh, the nearest stop and um, therefore it just gets more attractive. Here we have an excerpt from at least Neustadt, so the, oh, basically the elder half of the city and was also already mentioned the issue of city planning, especially in a socialist states where huge parts of, this, of the towns were completely newly planned and built. Um, here we have one example in Dresden uh, where you just see right in the middle, you have the public transport tracks so or the tram system that runs, runs through the center of this quarter and people can easily walk there. So it stops are in walking distance and then you use public transport to reach uh, their destination. So you see, it makes sense to bring together public transport and city planning. Also, of course, out of an architectural um, aspect. Um, so here we see uh, be beautiful small houses, um, but instead of basically having a foregarden, you need to have the parking space there for your car. So current alternative developments, um, for example, this area here in Freiburg in the southwest of Germany, where you have a rather dense population and a lot of green around, so um, which is, of course, a sensible compromise when it comes to city planning. Another um, alternative here, Amsterdam, uh, where you have a completely new part of the town um, and a lot of green areas around. And then, of course, public transport helps uh, to improve the climate of the cities or can help. So instead of uh, concrete roads, um, you can have green tracks and also green aisles, which help to improve uh, the air quality in the cities. Um, and you can reduce the pollution uh, in the city um, by public transport. Um, and in this case, also the greenery, of course, helps. And it is, of course, very interesting is that all this was already or the idea of how to integrate transport and city planning uh, is already very old. So we have here one fine example, um, the city of Hamburg, which was already mentioned. Um, <coughs> Fritz Schumacher, he was architect in Hamburg, he presented an access model for the development of the metropolitan area already in 1919. And you see right here in the middle, um, Altona and Hamburg city. Um, and then the idea is that the city should develop along these axes where you also always see the, the black kind of tracks the development axis right in the middle and then you have the various leaves 
where the town should develop around them. So there was already this idea of having people closer together so, so that we can focus the mobility needs so that it wouldn't sprawl around without any structure, but there should be um, a structure to it. And he called it the natural development of the organism. And interestingly, um, this overall model is such a success, it remains the basis um, for the planning till today. So let's move on to our day-to-day -day business. How do we connect trains, trams, and buses? This is kind of our access model, um, just our um, area of our PTA. Um, I have to say the VVO, it's one public transport authority in Germany of many public transport authorities because the idea is, as already said, that we want to have the cities and the regional transports around them together in, in one hand and uh, therefore kind of the extension of this is limited because the more partners you have, the more cities you have to integrate and the larger the area gets, the more companies you have, the more complex it gets. Um, nevertheless, we are kind of medium sized, there are way smaller PTAs uh, and of course, uh, very much larger transport authorities. <laughs> area um, around 4,800 square kilometers, 1.2 million inhabitants. Um, and you see the city of Dresden is right in the middle of it, more than 300 lines. And we had roughly 167 million passengers using our transport in 2021, as already said, not too big, not too small. So what we did right in the beginning when the VVO was set up, um, there was a proper analysis when it came to the allocation of services to a specific purpose. And then it was decided where should trains run, where should buses run, what should trams do, and very important, we should have these transit points to connect all these various means of transport. The idea with trains was right from the start that it should be fast transport between the various regions, and uh, which also led to the, to the fact that um, we closed down some um, train lines, which out of our perspective did not have the potential to, um, to sustain, so to have a sustainable development uh, in, the, in the long run. And sometimes it's just, um, way more efficient uh, and it's just cheaper and sometimes more efficient to, to use uh, buses to collect people from smaller villages and get them to the nearest train station. And we were going to see how we do that uh, also in a second. Yeah, and then tram services, of course, they are just the classic mass transportation in the metropolitan area and uh, in the smaller cities, all the the buses are used and these transit points and um, this is our, our centers where we connect individual transport public transport and also the various different means of transport and the overall idea is always to have it short and simple and offer easy, easy you know smaller distances to um, change between the bus and uh, the, the train or where you park your car and then the nearest train platform shouldn't be too far away and um, so on and so forth. And these are just, just for you to, to see them, the colorful 12 logos of the various companies uh, that operate in our area. And this is our access model. Um, you think again of Hamburg, what you saw, um, these are our transport access where it's our aim so that to, to always mobile, to, to get politicians to realize that these are our transport access and it would be very sensible to establish, for example, new living quarters and new industrial estates close to these access so that 
the people who have to work, for example, in an industrial complex know that they can easily use public transport to go there. And on the other hand, people who live somewhere in the surrounding area know this is the spot where I can live because I have good public transport to reach the city. Um, that works rather well. Um, there is always room for improvement. Um, and as was already mentioned, sometimes we are um, constant, no, we are not sometimes fighting, we are constantly fighting uh, because um, of our car focused um, industry in Germany and of course our car focused society in many areas, especially in rural areas where the car, you saw it, is so important. Um, we kind of had to sensibilize uh, politicians um, so that no, don't don't establish the industrial estate somewhere where we only have to get people there with extra bus services, but perhaps try to, to focus on the development of areas where we already have good public transport. So you see in orange, the suburban lines and uh, in black and green, the regional train services. And then we have uh, in the kind of pink, um, extra bus services who uh, have been upgraded to run at least at hourly at an hourly schedule so we kind of established also a proper um, timetable which is easily um, knowable um, rememberable for the passengers um, so that they can use public transport very easy um, we've also established um, a so-called Regio RBL, which is an ITCS system. So, which means that um, the buses and trains and trams they can kind of talk to each other. Um, so, uh, more than thousand vehicles they were equipped with GPS technology. A one central server takes care of all the regional bus services of currently nineteen companies in our transport authority and the one to the east. And each company still controls um, their own operation, but each operator is connected to the central server and the whole system operates uh, via our public mobile phone network. And what's the background for that? Um, the German railways, the Deutsche Bahn, they have already, they already had their own system where they always knew where are train where are the trains are they running on time and um, the same is true for the trams in the city but that was never true for all the bus companies because they're rather small and um, they needed to have a lot of investment to establish such a system so we kind of got them all together and pooled them when it came to that technology and integrated that, uh, which in the end means um, that we have for each stop um, always one central departure database. And we have a connection manager, which means that um, we can guarantee connections between trains and buses at certain defined points. So each month, colleagues get together from all the companies, they talk with each other and de define spots where we have to guarantee connections. So the, the bus gets the automated information from the train that uh, it is perhaps delayed and the bus should wait and vice versa, which of course means that the quality standard people know in the metropolitan area is carried also to, to, a, the, to a larger extent into the region. So to make it um, more attractive to use public transport also when you come from an outside area. So, and this is for example, one of those newly built uh, no, not no longer newly built, already some years old, but nevertheless, um, still a fine example of how you can shorten distances between uh, buses and trains. So here they share the same platform. Um, and we've invested a lot into this infrastructure and not us alone, but also um, public finances. So uh, what you can see here are uh, areas where you now can change easily between various modes of transport. For example, uh, on the top, 
This is Großenhain, a small town near Dresden and the area well, wasn't at all used. There were just some old buildings standing around and now they have a proper bus terminal. And what you can also see in the photo in the background is that you already, that you already see the train tracks so closely connected. And uh, down um, you can see that down on the right that you see the, the, the tram stop is right underneath the train station and uh, the suburban train service is just an elevator ride away. So um, this is, these are just two examples of all the new infrastructure that we created to make transferring easier um, and thereby getting people using more public transport and getting the car out of the city, uh, not by um, punishing it, but um, creating an alternative that is just so comfortable that people decide we want to use public transport. And um, so uh, there have been 71 projects uh, at 60 various places that had been finished. And these projects, they include park and ride facilities, bike and ride facilities, new bus terminals, whole new train stations. Um, so to get public transport closer to the place where the people live. Um, so a lot of money was invested by the state of Saxony, by local authorities and by us. And we currently have an average occupancy rate of all our park and ride facilities of over 60%. Depends very much uh, on the location, of course. And we've also seen enormous growth of passenger numbers for, for our standard. So there was a new train stop, uh, Bischofsplatz established several years ago, and we moved from zero to 2000 passengers uh, per day within uh, 16 months. What you can see here on the on this chart down on the left um, is one of our sensors that we've built um, at the park and ride facilities. So there are currently uh, 1,800 sensors at our park and ride facilities, uh, which means, and they are connected to our uh, mobile page and they're connected to our online presence. Uh, so people who want to park their car at a park and ride facility, which they can do for free, um, they can look online if there is still space available. Um, so that they don't, uh, are, that they are not disappointed, or we we can therefore just immediately direct them so that they don't have to go to a park and ride facility which is full, and then they have to go on drive to the next one and then perhaps go to the next one, but they can instead look immediately where does it look good, where may there be space available. So overall, what you can see here is that there are more than two and a half thousand parking spaces available. These are all these tiny little white and blue dots um, and barely readable, but park and ride, they say. And you can see that we've uh, built these facilities not only close to the city, but also further afield so that people use cars to an absolute minimum and change a very fast to public transport. Um, this is working rather well, despite of course the fact that the longer, the longer your journey is with public transport, the more expensive it is. But um, we've established here qu quite a lot of these park and ride facilities. And as I already said, the de demand is good. So we are really satisfied with that. And another aspect, of course, to, to make using public transport easier, to make it uh, more attractive, is that we've we, that we are creating more and more barrier-free stations. Um, out of 121 train stations within the VVO, 98 are currently barrier-free to use. And uh, we are constantly investing into it. Um, we have a joint investment program with um, the Deutsche Bahn, who owns all the stations, to modernize all the stations uh, who are used by more than 100 people per day. 
you can see here that the green spots, these are already the train stations that finished. And then you see some red ones that are the ones who are not barrier free at all. And then we have some yellow spots. These are the stations where you just need help um, in order to get into the train, but it's manageable. So um, yeah, some, some pictures, um, what we've kind of worked on and what's uh, working rather well. And we're also offering um, training sessions for people who need help, who um, walk slower, perhaps need a walking stick and so on, so that they can learn how to use public transport um, and that it's not that difficult so that they do not depend on other help, but they know that they can still use that they can still be mobile uh, with the help of public transport um, and all this also of course depends very heavily on help from the state um, and this working had been working rather well one where all trains are now have uh, are now um, offer now low floor entrance um, all the trams and buses in Dresden are low floor and most of the buses and regional services they also have low floor entrances and um, yeah to make it also attractive to use public transport in the leisure time of course um not so closely connected to today's topic but just to mention it briefly we you, we see a lot of potential among the tourists who come to our area um 33 percent of all our passengers in the vvo they use public transport in their leisure time which is good because we always see also some changes in living habits that when people use public transport in their leisure time sometimes then it makes it makes it easier for them to also use public transport when it comes to go to work or so and uh, we even have a higher modal split um, when we look at tourists 38 percent of all tourists who come here to the area use public transport and of course that helps um, to uh, reduce traffic congestion also in the city and also in the surrounding areas who sometimes are tourist spots. Now we have some exotic special means of transport and we never got rid of them, but uh, on the contrary, we take a lot of pride of it. Uh, they cost extra money, but we promote them very heavily so that we get more people using them, a kind of um, yeah, enhancing the, the trip into the nature or so by using also these historic tram, for example, or using a steam engine. Yeah, advertisement, we do that a lot um, in order to get more people using it, getting a positive vibe out of it, and making feel people comfortable with the decision to use public transport by making it just more uh, attractive. Um, the same applies to our marketing. We are constantly using this fine young gentleman who has a, a service car which goes around um, the region to smaller market towns who cannot afford an own service center for public transport. And he will answer the questions and he will sell you tickets and he takes some time to explain it. Um, but um, all this helps to enhance the image of public transport and lower the barrier to use public transport. So we use this whole wide area um, of marketing methods when it comes to the various channels of for communication from very personal face-to-face -face communication to press the mass media, print, we still use print, um, and of course, also via phone. Um, one difficult area, or not difficult, but one where there is currently very much movement is uh, the area of distribution. We have this aim that we offer consistently high levels of service and information at all companies. So we offer a lot of trainings for uh, the service staff of the company so that they know the fare structure, that they can really sell the passengers to the cheapest tickets available. And we offer this um, regularly, as I already said. And the uh, overall idea is always that people understand the system that you just have to buy one ticket and that you can then use everything. 
and um, we are pushing um, along this the way to digitalize uh, the distribution of the tickets more and more so that people will just use their mobiles to buy their tickets um, and um, but, but currently we are still offering the, the whole range. So from service points to ticket machines to, to mobiles, if you want to. Yeah, and just brief look at the fair system. We've tried to make it easy um, with these fair zones, um, but you may have heard that it currently pushes to, to create unified tickets for which are valid overall Germany monthly tickets. So um, that may even make the fare structures more easy, more transparent, which may be a good thing for the customer. And um, we are going to see how, how this works. It's, it's going to be an experiment for the next two years um, and also partly financed uh, by the state so that um, we are going to see how this works. We think our fare system isn't that bad, um, but of course that's our point of view. Um, but in the past, um, we've always seen passenger figures rising. Also the income of the companies has grown constantly over the years. Um, so now it's going, now we're going to see how this might change uh, in, in the future. And we hand out these unified informations regarding the fare system, which looks the same over all companies. And we offer these publications in various languages. And basically, that's it. Great, Christian. So it, it, it looks like a uh, something that uh, one sees quite often when traveling to, to Germany, this, this focus on integrated, uh, one ticket, uh, easy to understand public, uh, public transportation. Uh, I think this is an, um, you know, this integrated approach, I think it's extremely useful. Uh, one thing that came to my mind, I wanted to ask you, you, and you mentioned this very briefly, there's constant back and forth on how to plan and construct or extend existing lines. And, and you know, that um, uh, sometimes it's not clear in which directions to build. Sometimes uh, the developers have perhaps different interests or different priorities, right? So uh, let's say that new buildings or new production facilities might be, might be built in areas that lack uh, public transportation. Vice versa, when public transportation is extended in frequency, maybe in length in certain areas, you automatically bring more life to so those areas. So you, you allow easier development because people say, oh, it's so easy to commute. Look, they have a train every five minutes. If I found an apartment there, then this would be easier. How, how, how is this balance found between, let's say, interest of private developers that don't necessarily look at transportation as the primary, as the primary let's say, constraint in building, you know, maybe they want to have a very nice view, a lake nearby, just like you're showing us today or something like this. Uh, and, and one of the factors that, uh, that are of interest is availability of public transportation, but it's one of a, of a hundred. So how is this, you know, how is this process managed uh, in, uh, with, with, with these private interests of, of development and, and so on and so forth? Um, we, we try to get, this um, together with, um, with showing the benefits of how it's why it's sensible to have public transport close by. Um, and um, so for example, we had we have the city of Meissen, which is an old town. Um, and when we built there, for example, um, a, a new train station, there was a private investor who, who thought perhaps he could, build something there because he thought that when public transport comes um, and the commuter trains stop there, there will be more passengers, um, for, for example, for a shopping center. And we worked then very closely together and used this positive drive that he already had um, in order to, to get this closer together. So um, that, that, for example, he has, a, he has a huge parking space there, which we use also as park and ride facility, um, which, which uh, 
works uh, rather well, but you have to have at least an open-minded investor. If somebody is really constantly focusing just on cars, 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 and it's, it's very difficult that you have to constantly talk and tell them, hey, um, perhaps um, we, if you integrate public transport, um, it may be even more attractive for, for your investment because then the noise levels will go down, pollution will go down, the air system, will, the air quality will be better. So you constantly have to talk about the benefits of public transport and keep on talking um, and uh, try to get also politicians that, that, that you have the public, the public and um, as, as somebody who, who is sensible about this issue and perhaps pushes the investor also towards the idea of integrating everything a little bit. It's, it's not about fighting the car constantly and trying to get it out, but it, it's always important to, to show, uh, hey, let's find a sensible compromise. And there are certain areas where the car is basically without an alternative, mm -hmm. um, especially in rural areas. And then you have other bits and pieces like this, the towns we talked about, the metropolitan areas where there are sensible um, alternatives uh, so let's get them closer together okay and, and just last question are there any uh, regional uh, let's say um, regulatory uh, support or maybe tax benefits for developing or taking into consideration uh, public transportation and developing for example in the u.s there is the requirement to have a certain number of parking spots yep uh, yeah we okay. have, for example, we have that in our city, in Dresden as well, okay. that, 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 you, that you have to provide, on the one hand, a certain amount of um, space for parking cars, but um, you can reduce that or they want to, to you, you benefit when you reduce that and instead of um, opening up more alternatives regarding uh, public transport. Okay. And maybe, I Amenea, mean, yeah, one comment from my side. Um, the zoning regulations in Germany are quite strict. So a city district, Stadtvertretung, they can always vote in favor or against a certain project from an investor. Okay. And in many cases, they turn down projects when they first of all understand that from a kind of um, change of flows, this is not in the overall interest of the city. For instance, taking out purchasing power on people outside, you know, the greenfield solution for shopping, a lot of these projects are actually not approved by the city councils for many good reasons. Understood. Yeah, that's actually a very good uh, uh, good mechanism to keep uh, in check, you know, urban sprawl or, or things like this. Uh, 